I'm uh, very blessed to be sitting on Wulguru Kebab in country in Townsville in North Queensland. I saw a Townsville sing out there earlier. So just pay respect to elders, past, present and future. And um, just, uh, yeah, I really want to, you know, pass that on to all the uh, different countries that are joining us from today and, and acknowledge the, the tall trees that we stand upon to be here delivering this to you. And also acknowledge the... Um, World Indigenous Peoples Conference of Education going on in Adelaide right now. Uh, two and a half thousand edu Indigenous education experts from around the world joining to share um, some of the amazing work that's been doing. So just a big thing out to, to all of them and, and thank you everyone for, for joining. Thanks, Jesse. And I'm on Ngunnawal and Nambury land here in, in Canberra. So, you know, from one end of the of, of um, country to the other. I'll just introduce myself. I'm Tony Felusi and I um, am one of the project officers for the on the computer science education research um, group with Adelaide University and I have been with that amazing group for many years now and have worked with some great some great people and continue to work with some amazing people and I'm really excited for today. It's an area that I'm growing in and learning and learning about and from so I'm really excited about today and it's been amazing to be working with Jesse to to um, deliver this workshop together. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, so my name's Jesse King. I'm a one new man from Gulf Country, northwestern Queensland. Um, grew up and, and live in Wulgurukabar, Bindle Country, and Townsville. Um, so I, I formerly worked, I used to work with Stronger Smart Institute, but I've changed jobs recently. So to Aurora Education Foundation, but this is something I definitely wanted to see through to the end, um, you know, and the work we've been doing, um, meeting with the computer science education research group and, you know, the, the how those conversations have developed to where, where we are today. So, yeah, looking forward to sharing and learning together and, yeah, and hopefully you'll all find something useful that you can take back into your context to help help um, improve your teaching and, and in the end improve outcomes for, for the kids. That's what we're, we're all here for. Right? Yeah. And um, today's not about a big polished kind of presentation. It's more of us, you know, that two way conversation and us and us chatting along with you. The way this all came about was um, Jesse was working with Rebecca Vivian, who is on maternity leave at the moment. So um, I got to step in and start working with Jesse when, you know, Rebecca went on, on to leave. And so I you know it was a bonus for me, but that conversation and that relationship building started a, a number of years ago with Jesse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's been a bit of a long yarn and, and waiting to see what we can do. But, and, and we'll talk a bit about that in this session, about, you know, the importance of forming high expectations relationships with each other and with our students, with our communities and families, um, you know, and how that can actually really enrich, enrich the learning process and really start from a place of um, respect and, and equitable values when, when working in in, in um incorporating more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures into, into your teaching and learning programs. What we're going to try and look at today is we're going to look at a culture for some culture responsive pedagogies and how, how they can be applied in digital technologies curriculum. Um, we're going to look at a process called connective art theory. Uh, we're all going to have a go at it. Um, and look, there's going to be sharing and talking as well. So there will be some breakout sessions. We're going to have a look at some lesson ideas and just have a bit of a conversation so you can see the process uh, Tony and I have gone through around how we sort of um, explore to expand the space a little bit more and then um, we will make sure there's time for a Q&A session at the end. Um, please ask questions throughout the um, in the chat box and we will try and get back to them. If it's a really burning question, copy and paste it back when we come back to the Q&A. Um, if we don't get a chance to get to your questions, we will endeavour to pull together a bit of a Q&A um, response because um yeah we're definitely keen to hear what you want to know what you find valuable um or what you want to explore in, the, in this space so as we are going to focus in on relational waves uh we do have ask you if you can turn your turn your camera on be prepared to turn your camera on be prepared to have a conversation with people um be prepared to um learn a little bit about yourself um and learn a little bit about others as well um and that's really um, fundamentally how we're going to explore these these concepts within the DT curriculum for today. Tony, is there anything you want to add on to that? Uh, no, no, just that, that whole relationship building, I think, is, is an essential part of today. So we hope that's 
um, you know, what you get a chance to do as well. Yeah, cool. So just to just to really start the day or start the session off, we're just gonna we're not gonna get bogged down too much on theory, but we're just gonna introduce a few definitions and frameworks that we're just gonna be utilizing through this. So we're really talking about when we're talking about cultural responsive pedagogies, we're talking about pedagogies that really mobilize those cultural repertoires. They are intrinsically dialectic. You have to have conversation. It's about um, creating a safe space for, for um, ideas and opportunities to emerge. And it's also resting on the premise that, that curriculum and pedagogy are culturally based, right? So to be looking at a culture responsive pedagogies approach, where we just want to frame that up. That comes out of the work led by um, Anne Morrison and Professor um, Lester Abina Regman in University of South University of Adelaide, sorry, <laughs> um, around and was one of the largest um, systematic literature reviews of cultural responsive pedagogy and literature worldwide. Um, it's really a uh, nice light read, but there's also some good YouTube clips on it as well. The references are at the end of the slides if you want to deep dive a bit more. Um, and Jesse, I noticed on that you were talking about responsive pedagogies as a plural. That was. Um one of the points that you were making earlier when we were having a chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I guess a conversation around, um, and you've been engaging with a few different models and whatever and papers that I sent through, Tony, and it's like, you know, it's not necessarily about good and bad. It's about what's effective for a broader range of people and really making sure that we're allowing for the student's worldview and the student's reality to come into the teaching and learning environment. Um, so it's about, looking at different pedagogies um, and how to build upon those to, to really increase the scope of how you're delivering uh, content to the to the students. And, and, you know, and I know there's a lot of um, jurisdictions around the country that will have, this is the pedagogical focus we're going to do, but there are elements, and I know there's agency for teachers to really um, know what works best for their kids and how to then interpret and reinterpret or deconstruct and reconstruct that into their context. Where these conversations really started from was around, um, and, and I'm going to sing out the Gwimpy model here in the work from Professor Chris Matthews and the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Mathematics Alliance. Please jump on the link. I'm not going to deep dive into this. Chris does it much better than I am. Katie, who's online, probably does it better than me too. Um, but realistically, utilising the Gumpy model within mathematics and engaging with another element, so I was able to really start deep diving and have, asking the questions with Chris, luckily enough, to how does this look, what does this look like in a digital technology lesson? Can it be applied? Can we, can we modify it, adapt it, or, or whatever? And essentially, you know, um, the Gumpy model is made up of those four uh, constructs around reality and the process of reality creation, abstraction, the mathematics with critical reflection, and within those sitting create, creativeness and creativity, symbols and cultural bias. So there's a really good video on the APSIMA website where Chris explains that in depth. I would recommend you dive into that. We're not going to explain that um, too much here, but what we will show is the next slide is essentially um, from a really... Uh, big brain adaptation. We've just shifted maths and uh, digital technologies. Really think that, you know, mathematics is an abstract or is a way to view the world. It's an abstraction of the, of the reality and we utilize the language of mathematics to, to interpret that in a common language. Within digital technologies and computing and stuff like that, it's very similar in the sense of we have to take the reality and we have to abstract it into a particular forms and functions to be able to eventually get to where we want um, where we want students to get to and where we need people to get to in, in the big open world. But, you know, in, in a classroom, and we all know how where digi digital technology sits in relation to KLAs, time, time um, connected and stuff, it gives a really good framework to really have those critical reflections around the concepts we're talking about in digital technologies and how children often already have these conceptual understandings and these frameworks and, and, and are able to justify it in their reality. But how do we actually then introduce those digital technology concepts that respond to the curriculum? And that's what we're going to play around with and, and, um, and do today um, and hopefully do justice um, to it. Thanks, Katie, for the message. <laughs> All right. You can go back and tell Chris and he can, he can slap me on the wrist next week if I mock it up too bad. No, he's been pretty good guy. 
All right, so we might look at the next screen change. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to um, start off with you building a dialogue with each with each other. So, you know, Chris has talked about, um, sorry, Jesse has talked about, you kept saying Chris and now I've gone to, to Chris. Jesse's talked about that relational um, building, that relationship building. And so we're um, going to start off with a breakout room. And what we're going to do is you're going to be randomly assigned to the breakout room in groups of, of about four. And you're going to be, we're going to share a slide deck with you that has um, a, a separate activity for each of the breakout rooms. The slides will look like what is here on the screen. And the only thing you really need to worry about in this part of the activity is this step one, this icebreaker card. And it's a, a chat card. It's got some two prompts on it for you to, to choose one of those questions to have a chat with each other in, in your breakout room and respond to, to those, um, those prompts. All right. I think, is everyone back or are we still waiting? Uh, they're closed, yep. Okay, cool. All right, thanks everyone. And we really appreciate it. You know, we, we know it's hard doing these things sometimes. Um, so thanks for, for your engagement and hopefully you, you had a bit of a, a bit of a chat with each other. Um, whether you used our questions or not, that's fine. The, um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try and like sort of take you through how we envisage this in a classroom activity. It's not going to be exactly how you do it in a classroom. You'd probably do it over, because essentially we're zeroing in on, on a content descriptor in year four and five, so or three and four, sorry, Tony, I can't remember exactly. But um, what we want you to look at, just to experience it a bit, and, and we'll rush over it. Obviously in a classroom, you've had a lot more time with the kids over the term or, or have the structure and you know, you, 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 you don't obviously also have those pre pre existing relationships as well. So what we're going to ask each of you to do now is some personal reflection time. So um, we want you to reflect on your life with technology. And we want you to use a pen and paper. You can use a Microsoft Paint or whatever you want. Um, I want you to tell your story in ten key moments, but we don't want you to use words. We'd like you to create your own symbols. Okay. I want you to have a think about those 10, 10, um, 10 moments in your life that are tech, what you think of technology and what the symbols are. Uh, we'll give you about seven minutes to do that. You can be as artistic as you like. Um, usually we would do this with posters and or on journals with crayons and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I'll leave it up to you. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to come back then and then we're going to um, look at a way to then co-create a shared journey um, together. Have a bit of a think and reflect on your journey with technology and 10, 10 key moments using symbols to tell those stories. Thanks, Tony. So some of you may be thinking that is a very quick seven minutes, and you would be correct in thinking that. So you can keep drawing. I'm just going to have a little bit of a chat of where we're sitting in regards to the Gumpy model at the moment, and then we're going to move into the next um, piece of the activity. So essentially what we've done is we've started off with your worldview, with your reality, and we're situating it in your reality and allowing you to start using symbols, be creative, um, and ensure that any cultural bias is that of your own. Um, so that's the intention of this piece. Often we'll think as, um, we might think as educators that we're gonna start with the, um, the curriculum and the digital technology. We're gonna really focus in on that and uh, hammer in on the, um, whatever the content descriptor is and the learning intentions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this one, it's really about allowing us to come along and bring our own worldview and create a space to bring our own story to it. The, um, we will connect it back to DT a bit later and we will focus in and explore a little bit those phases of abstraction and the phases of critical reflection. And, and what, what we're, we're thinking, and it'd be interesting to compare this to some of the work that someone has been doing, is that teachers often are spending time in the, starting with the mathematics and then not spending the deep dive and the critical reflection to connect it to the reality. And the reality they may be connecting it to may be that of their own, 
rather than that of their students. Um, and also then being able to extract the reality, utilizing um, what what what's the actual um, form and function of digital technologies? How do we what do we need to do? What are we trying to learn? What's the sequential knowledge we're trying to build within students? Tony, is there anything you want to add on to that? We're looking at the the concepts rather than than specific content. I think and yeah. starting, starting in that reality, I think is is a really important um, aspect to kind of highlight. Yeah, because, because starting in the curriculum or the KLA in that area can be quite abstract, right? It's a mm. quite a big uh, cognitive leap, especially for primary school students and especially for even a lot of adults around understanding the building blocks of how we get to, um, you know, being able to talk to each other in, in this, in, you know, forum right now. So we might go on to the next piece of the puzzle time or piece of the jigsaw, sorry. Right. What I'm going to show you, I'm just going to share with you a story, right? Um, and then we're going to have a bit of a chat about um, just about that. Uh, and this is where we're really looking at spotlighting and highlighting uh, First Nations um, approaches, right? So what this artwork is a piece of art that was designed by a fellow named Jurpi Mulkai and a lady named Liz Cook. Um, and it represents a story uh, from Program at Stronger Smarter Institute around the Teachers of STEM Initiative. Okay, and that, that's a project that's um, designed to uh, get 99 First Nations women uh, and get them through a STEM teaching scholar, uh, STEM teaching qualification. Funded for 10 years, there's another five years in the project. If you know any people who might be, um, might be eligible, please feel free to pass the information on to them. Um, you can find it on the Strongest Smarter website. But that story there tells the journey and the place of women within STEM in the world, okay? It also highlights different elements and, and whatnot. Now, what I'd normally do is I'd normally ask questions, what symbols can you see, what um, things, for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to take you through a few of the, the main points on that, um, on that journey. So what we'll see going through the middle or actually, you know what, in the chat box, just throw down some of the things you see. I might just look at some of those that might be a better way to do it. Um, what you'll see going through the middle is a, is a river, it's a journey. And within that, you can see the white backbone. And that's talking about um, when the artist and Auntie Liz got together, talking about backbone and the role women play as a strong backbone within the society. And what we can see is those navigating through those rocks are those cultural grounding points. And those rocks are about the places where you have your, your, your cultural safe spaces, your, your elders in your community, your knowledge holders. Um, and you can see the journey is not always smooth. There's many ups and downs and the meanders. Yep. Within those pools, the black pools and the, the concentric circles, they're meant to be ripples. Okay, and that's talking about the ripple effect that you can have through um, getting an education and becoming an educator within STEM and the ripples that ripple out beyond just yourself to your family, your community and, and um, you know, the broader society. Each of those four circles and someone uh, mentioned women sitting in, in a circle, that, that's correct, sitting around a meeting place. The STEM was reimagined into the four elements and those four elements being fire, earth, air and water and if you were to drill down into that painting you'd then see different elements of stem thinking that have been demonstrated by first nations people of australia and the torah first nations people of the torah strait since time in a immemorial okay so you can see elements of the seven sisters i don't know if you can see my um mouse on there or not um in the fire one, we've got the fire sticks and the xanthorea trees, and that's the one on the far left of the screen, the seven sisters. Uh, we've got the nets and the Bunya mountains and the song lines across the country and the earth in the next one. You see the wind and the spirit and the and understanding the difference um, of, um, you know, how winds work and what they bring, bring along with it in the air. And then in the last, uh, piece on the right there, you've got the fish traps, you've got cool and water, uh, scar trees, canoes, um, and whatnot. So 
that story essentially is a way that we can represent data and we can represent um, information. And we're able to then translate and share that information. Tony, can you go to the next slide? So from there, I don't know how well you can see this, but that, that link there to the um, SASTA journal is a really good um, special edition of Science Australian, South Australian Science Australian, South Australian Science Teachers Association did um, teaching Indigenous science. And within that, there was an article written by Joe Sambona. And Joe's got a lot of um, big brain ideas about how we can actually work within the curriculum to incorporate Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. I mean, he's previously with the CARA in that role, similar to what Katie had in, um, and then is now working at QUT. The, what we're seeing here is the sort of, um, he calls it the inverted hourglass, right? He talks about where ways that where teachers the end of the, the what teachers can play in because this is always an issue right the issues around what can I teach what can't I teach and really talking about um it's not the job of teachers necessarily to teach culture in the school it's the job to spotlight and highlight different elements of it and different sophistication levels with um, the way it comes is looking at um, court, EG's Cordage is an example here, Cordage of the world's First Nations people, Cordage of Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders First Nations pe people, Cordage of Tasmania's First Nations people, and then Cordage Technology of Melbourne and Eden people. And that's really narrowing down. That's really the limit there of highlighting the knowledges and sophistication around, um, around the teacher limit independently. But what you see down into the bottom part of the um, hourglass is the potential opportunity of cultural content if community is engaged, if you've got a knowledge holder with you, if you're following those processes and you can look at the actual cultural and IP aspects, you can look at different fibre sources in your region, you can look at fibre processing techniques and you can get kids doing um, activities to recreate different fibre models. Really recommend having a read of that um, that paper if you get a chance but really what I want you to think about is we're not here to teach you to teach kids about how to do Aboriginal art we're here about how we can showcase and celebrate it as an example of data representations and then allow the kids to create their own symbols and interpretations to then be able to use it as a teaching tool uh, for connecting it back to the to the content descriptor and, and the achievement standard we're trying to trying to um achieve there. All right, is there anything you want to add on to that, Tony? I think that's a really important part, that it's not our job as teachers to to be teaching culture. I think that's a, yeah. the takeaway from the yeah. really important. And, and you know, the um, <laughs> that image of, of that hourglass, I think, is, yeah. is a great um, visual yeah. for that. And however, it is teachers' responsibility to make space to spotlight it within the curriculum where you can, right? And that's really where the work on the elaborations in the science curriculum really started off a movement. I know there's some work in the maths elaborations has been working on, and there's conversations about it. giving teachers more examples of how you can use this in a, in a way that's going to be culturally safe for you and the community, and a way that you're going to be able to not have to have in 20 years kids saying why were we never talk why was why didn't we learn this in school which is a, a common um, question we get asked like, all the time yeah. um and i'm sure people have, have, have asked that question or have been asked it um you know so it's about us and it's about our agency and the education system of opportunities we can to give you know if you give a kid 10 experiences of the cross curriculum priority across 12 year each year for 12 years of their schooling, you know, it does build up, it does start providing a different picture to what um what may have been from the, the silence or the omissions that have occurred in previous um iterations of the education system in the past. Yeah. All right. Can we go on to the next slide, please? They're already <laughs> awesome. Sorry, I was just cross-checking time, you know. Yeah, no, you're very good at multitasking. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back into our breakout rooms. We're going to ask you to, to share your story, share some of your, um, what your, your journey with technology and your 10 data points, okay? Now we're going to ask you to then co-create a shared poster utilising the Magma platform. Um, and I will hand it over to Celia to explain how that's going to work. No? 
Yes. Okay, not right now, but what okay. we want you to – oh, sorry. Do you want me to show Magma on the screen so we can just show them what it looks yeah, like? Yeah, if you want, yeah. So Magma is just a – it's a really cool little platform where you can get together and you can all jump on a paint on a paint tool and it's quite you can do quite a bit with it um what we'll do you'll stay in your same breakout groups you'll all get you'll all have a link that would be in the google doc i imagine um and then you're going to co-create you're going to have a chat in your groups about tony's tony's puppy is around it again the um about the image you create you're going to share and have a chat this is my story da, 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 da. and as you're talking about it you may want to start co-creating a group piece so essentially and, and we're not going to probably get all the way into it but um, essentially, we're looking at if you're all got 10 data points, we're going to have 40 different data points within the story. We could then go along and categorize them into country, place, people, culture, identity, et cetera, et cetera. That's the sort of thread of, of where we would go with this as in a classroom and in a classroom setting. Um, so just to give you a bit of a play with the tool um, and a chance to just um, continue to build your relationships, we'll break you out into the room for 10 minutes we'll say um if the timing is a bit is a bit long just just let us know and pop back in or whatever um we, we, we're fairly flexible and in, in that um we wanted you to engage with the process a bit but we also understand um you may just want to move on to other things as well <laughs> i think this is a really important part of the process though that's that it's that sharing of of those um uh symbols that are that are emerging yeah. through that conversation of you know my i might have some symbols that are similar to you or i might have used a different symbol to represent a similar experience so i think yeah. those conversations are are really really important to have so um we, we want you to have a chance to do that yeah. in terms of aggie we're going to put you back into the same breakout rooms that you were in um access the same slides again and this is where that link comes in that was on on your slides so each breakout room has their own um magma it's now called magma sorry this magma um uh, sheet or well, drawing tool um some of the things i just want to point out to you um is the the pen tool here and the eraser tool are probably uh the, your two most uh, important important tools you can change your colors um and the layers is another important one. So because you're co-creating on this one on this one screen, um, sometimes when you go to draw draw something, you might be drawing over the top of somebody. But if you click on a layer and double click on a layer, the layer becomes yours, and nobody else can draw on that layer. But you'll still see it through. So have a play, see what works best. Have that discussion in your room about whether you're just going to all stay on one layer or whether you're going to use, you know, multiple layers and layer your picture um, over the top of each other. So if you accidentally double click on it and you end up that it says that it's, you know, so if I double click on here, it tells me now it's my layer and nobody else can draw on it. Um, I can leave that layer and open it up so people can, can come back onto it. They're probably the, you know, the most useful tools for you in this really short, short time frame that you have. Um, but this is just a, a free platform. So when you click on, I'm just going to go back to the slides for a moment. When you click on the link, which some of you have probably already done already, um, this is the first screen that you'll see and this will pop up. You do not have to create an account. You just can click on this button down here that says continue without, without an account. And that's... Um, what we're going to get you to do just go off have a have a chat remember we're approaching a pedagogy now that's intrinsically dialogic and that's the sort of purpose of it. we're having that conversation we're building the conceptual concepts together around symbols and, and data collection welcome back so can we just do a quick uh temperature check we'll just do a thumbometer thumbs up thumb sideways thumbs down how did you find that that process and that time to have a yarn and share be nice and high out in front of the screen so we can see uh yeah cool oh digital thumbs awesome there's a couple of sideways ones and yeah yeah it is it is a bit challenging, isn't it? To you know have to start those dialogues with people you don't know. Um, you know, think about your journey with technology. Actually, use a tool that you haven't probably used before. There's lots of there's a steep learning curve there in that very short amount of time, as well as taking all of that uh, information that that we've yeah. talked about so far. So, um, you know, yeah. brain explosion I think could be a good emoji as well. 
Yeah, and this is the we were having a discussion while the while you're in the rooms creating your your imagery, and um, you know, you'd probably look at doing this for a lesson with kids, you know, to really just get that. Then the next step might be um, and Tony, if you just want to go back a couple of slides, just back to the where we have the themes, the categories, or whatever. To then categorize it start organizing information so what we started to do is we're starting to abstract from their reality and hang through the abstraction process um, to start introducing the concepts we want to be talking about in the curriculum um, and now we can go back to that other slide please say so, oh we might just stop on the padlet one quick oh, that one? <laughs> there's a bit of a lag on my screen sorry oh, so okay yeah i'm too fast and then it's getting, like oh, nope. yeah so if someone, hopefully someone's downloaded the image, um, please jump in and share it on your, um, on the Padlet, uh, upload it on, under your group uh, um, number system. And then, you know, that'll just help us. It'll be um, part of this is we're going to actually present on, on this workshop how it went, what the learnings were, what the feedback was um, at the Google side, Computer Science Education Network meeting and partnership group in the end of, um, I don't know, it's in December or something, isn't it? Yeah, end of November. Yeah. End of November. Okay, yeah. that's coming quick. Yeah, the sure. um yeah, yeah, yeah. So and this is a one of the things. So I'm I'm currently undertaking a master's philosophy and what I'm trying to do is really explore. I'm doing a it sounds very it's really boring actually. It's a Foucauldian discourse analysis of how the technologies curriculum positions Aboriginal students and Aboriginal knowledges, right? And what 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 I found was the, really, the, a lot of the only work in the lit review phase coming out around DT education in Australia is coming out of University of Adelaide, coming out of this group. And there's not a lot of, there's a lot not known and a lot not asked about how First Nations context and content is positioned in this. And there's not a lot worldwide. There's some culturally responsive commuting education coming out of the US. There's some technologies education coming out of South Africa. But essentially, because it's such a new space, um, we're actually going, you know, we're still not, we're still learning best ways to teach it. And, and you know, and, and one of my passions and, and pushes is that we need to start looking at First Nations content now rather than 10, 15 years down the track and trying to retrofit it back in. And that'll actually allow us to have a much more, um, you know, much more open opportunities um, coming forward and making sure we're, we're giving as many kids as possible the opportunity to get to a year 10 standard, you know what I mean? And we know what the stats are and then that by CTL and things like that. And it's, you know, 50% of all kids, you know, and it's, I think it's 25% of First Nations children aren't reaching those standards, you know. So we want to be able to shift that and, and we believe we can by bringing these sorts of practices and processes in. Yep. So, Tone, do you want to go to that? Next slide, please. Right, so this is what we were saying. So now we would start abstracting um, and now we'd really start talking about things like the data representations. The other thing we wanna talk about here in this, this part right here is we wanna talk about that you could essentially use this in the discussions as we look at the curriculum, you could use this to teach the data representation elements across the whole primary scope, possibly even into the secondary just by introducing. So using the same activity you can actually go back to just the really foundational stuff or you can actually start taking it up into the into the middle years as well um and and really not wanting to highlight that a process like this and utilizing these sorts of processes and the applications broadly across your curriculum areas i'm sure if you're teaching dt there's probably a high likelihood that you're teaching it across across the primary school or whatnot um and it also allows students to get comfortable with the process and with with opportunities, um, and the other thing I was saying to Tony, we use this connected art theory approach, or I've used it in, in several different contexts around completely different things, not to do with digital technologies, around um, working with um, creating a new culture in a um, large tech organisation versus um, you know really looking at um, highlighting what connects us as um, in the curious minds group, Tony, with um, the girls and all the different uh symbols that actually bring them together and make them strong you know so there's heaps of different applications you can use this process for the um tony do you want to just talk a bit about you want to dive into the digital technology stuff a little bit here and then we'll talk okay yeah um, yeah, yeah we're gonna well we look at the um i'll unpack the digital technologies a little bit when we look at 
the curriculum part. But I think um, the one of the things that we, we talked about when we were, you know, developing this workshop was that it's not around the, the teaching of the of the content descriptor. It's around uh, und the underpinning concepts of the, the curriculum and, you know, what, looking at those at those elements that that are supporting the right that supported the writing of the digital technologies curriculum. Yeah, you were, you were you were saying exactly that exactly those things that actually spending the time to to unpack and to do this activity gives you that reality to then move forward into those abstract um, those mm. abstract concepts because really data if you just started talking about data and you know zeros and ones and binary and that you know computers need data that's a really abstract concept and you know what does it do with it how does it process it what it what is data um, and I think starting with this reflective activity is a, is a really good part to bring it back to to the individual and back to that person and connecting to what they already know and and something that they can understand mm. and those rich learning opportunities really occur in that abstraction space and in the critical reflection space so once you've built the scaffolds up around the different concepts you're wanting to apply and introducing whatever the curriculum descriptor is or whatever the, whatever you're trying the content descriptor yeah. um then when you're critically reflecting back what are just some of the fundamental things if we're talking about data representation we're literally just talking about a way to share information you know mm -hmm. and we're, we're spending we need to spend time in those conversations and as teachers when we're planning things i think i, I think i've touched on this before it's about going okay this is what i'm going to teach in the curriculum i'm going to contextualize it for the kids by giving them a b and c example and then we're going to jump into some activity around organizing data it's not actually allowing students the time and space or uh, and a broad range of students so what you're probably seeing is kids who uh have a cultural bias to you as a teacher are probably going to respond to that because they're able to join the dots a lot quicker. Kids who are coming from different cultural backgrounds are going to need a little bit more scaffolding around bringing their worldview and, and acknowledging that their who they are ha has the they have these understandings and concepts somewhere within their experiences within the world. And I think um, that's around where the really rich piece is around if, if you're looking from the co content descriptor to the reality, do you as a teacher really understand and have you spent time yourself? What am I conceptually talking about? And Chris Matthews said it really well to me the other day. He said, you know, we're talking about place value. What are we talking about? We're talking about numbers, size. And again, essentially, and Katie, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, he was saying that, you know, it's literally just a way to organize numbers. It's an organization approach, you know, it's that's fundamentally what we're doing. So if you know how to organize things, you can organize numbers. There's a special way to do it. And that's a way that is communicating across, um, you know, multiple languages in the language we call maths. Same with digital technology, same with the different computer languages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you just want to hit the next slide. So I say, yeah, data representations, quite managing and analyzing data. So, you know, that's that's where we want to really make sure that that's probably a key point we want to drive home is conceptually, have we spent the time understanding that what what's the core concept? And then are we giving students the time to abstract from their reality back into the core concepts? And that's where we build those scaffolds around them as we go through. And of course, we're not having time to do that in today's, you know, condensed version of what we're doing. And but the more often that you follow this process, the more comfortable you become with it and and students will as well in the classroom. And it really gives you a chance then to really start discovering and discussing creativity, which allows them to bring themselves, creating and symbols, how we represent. We use symbols in everything, right? Letters and stuff like that. By asking students to create their own symbols, you're actually, you're not putting a barrier around them of what symbols already exist. Yes, we use, um binary or we use this language or we use whatever um but to, to give that that conceptual bridge is about allowing them to bring their creativity and it's also acknowledging then that cultural bias exists it's not about trying to remove it 
if we were to continue going through this process from a First Nations perspective, there would be a cultural bias to First Nations people. That may be why you, you might have found this additionally challenging because that's a, their concepts you may not be familiar or comfortable with, yeah? But what we're doing is um, we're, we're acknowledging that the cultural bias exists. So what we're able to do then is um, build in uh, safeguards, probably isn't the right word, but approaches to make sure we're, we're, we're not shying away from that and we're actually... Um, you know, providing um, tools to, to, to take into account. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a, a bit later. I just want to highlight some of the, the key parts of the digital technologies curriculum. And I think one of the aspects that quite often gets missed with the curriculum is that it's that three dimensional structure. And you might have heard that, you know, people say, oh, yeah, it's three dimensions to the curriculum. But what actually does does that mean? And it this, um, this structure came out um, as a result of the Melbourne Declaration on Educational Goals for Young, young Australians in 2008. And um, that, they identified that a world-class curriculum needed to have more than just learning areas. There was more to, to um, education than just, you know, our, subject, our subjects. And it needed to include fundamental skills and capabilities that would be able to respond to a changing world. And so the three layers of the curriculum are the learning areas. So we've got your eight learning areas, the general capabilities and the cross curriculum priorities. And it's those priorities that give students the chance to focus on the content um, with the regional and national and global significance. And, you know, that's where we're looking uh, today. Mm. Yeah, and I guess like, you know, the thing, the challenge we then hit is that we're, the KLA is a driven, mm. we're assessed on the KLA is, that's how everything works, the key learning areas, and that's the sort of lanes we swim in. And, and, and it's about then trying to find ways that, how can we flip it around and look at a cross curriculum priority to drive, um, or a general capability, but a cross curriculum priority in this case to drive the learning experiences and building a, a piece of work or repeat learning, teaching and learning units around it. Um, and, and really being able to then achieve more breadth in, in what you're doing with your contextualization. Uh, so you're not having to reteach context all the time, time with students as well. Yeah, and it's about the learning, not not the content, you know, that's the not the KLA content is and I think as yeah. teachers that's where we go. Straight often we go to that content and then see how we can fit the other stuff in, which is we we want to flip that around and I think that's yeah. probably one of the a key message from today. Yeah, and, and I suppose it's and then it, it's not going to work in every case. It's it's going to be what works in what context or whatever. But we believe this is it's been a fair bit of work done in a range of KLAs now to show that this there is um there is efficacy in this. Um, so yeah, these are you know the the three uh, cross curriculum. Um, priorities. We're looking at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures today because it are applied across all of the learning areas. One yeah. of the things I want to highlight with the new curriculum website is the interactivity of it. So you can now go into the organising ideas of the um, priorities and under each of the organising ideas you'll see these um, symbols. And if you click on that symbol, it'll take you to that part of the that learning area and all of the uh, content descriptors and elaborations will come up that are uh, where, where it's an authentic uh, be um, addressing or in, incorporating some of these organising ideas. Yeah, it's it's where the Australian Kakara have signposted ways you can do it. But then the flip on that too is also being aware that within an elaboration of a content descriptor, it doesn't necessarily always get signposted in the curriculum. But what that then does is then if we're not signposting for teachers, we're actually losing opportunities. And then the hidden messages that occur there, if it's if you can't include a Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander cross curriculum priority in this space, they don't have any need or any demonstrations of being able to bring that cultural view into this piece of place and we're able to prove that quite successfully with the science elaborations um, and the work that was done previously um, led by Joe Sambono and, and a bunch of people at CSIRO about having to go and have those arguments that yes we can teach physics with fire starting it's not in the curriculum as elaboration but we can 
we're very certain we can connect it to the content descriptor and then get through that. So there's a flip there and yes, it's there, but always looking at it at a lens of how else could this be interpreted because you're you're going to understand your context and your expertise and skill set better than anyone else. So yeah. just, to, just to sort of, yeah, to be wary of. Yeah, one of the other parts with the elaborations is that, you know, sometimes it's not connected to your community and, and your the country that you're on is is another thing to be to be aware of as well, you know, that they are um, sometimes they've been written very specific to a to a community. And so, um, you know, thinking, oh, I'm not in that area, I can't teach that, you know, actually delving a bit, a bit deeper and asking questions. I think that's um, one of the big things as well. Don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, and if you don't, if you don't know something, I've, I've learned that being able to ask, ask for help is, is been a, a big, um, a, a really important way of being able to grow myself as well in this area. And, and underpinning that is actually creating a relationship before you're deep diving into it. So, so this is just sort of acknowledging then that um, we're all bringing our own, our, everyone is a cultural being, right? If we're looking at it through the culture responsive uh pedagogies definition that was shared earlier that all, all curriculum is culturally based so we all bring our own worldview onto whatever term you want to use um and then that's being able to um taking the knowns to the unknowns and be able to deconstruct and reconstruct what those biases mean how they may then appear within the curriculum areas we're teaching whether it's um you know and i suppose with data it becomes the um I can't quite remember what our next we've jumped a few slides. Yeah, so we jumped forward. So we're talking data still, but when you, you're talking data in the digital technologies, there's also that shared focus on on data in, in maths. And, you know, it, that's always been there, but it's now um, strengthened because some of the, the content that used to sit in digital technologies in 8.4 is now being yeah. situated in, in maths. And it's that shared focus. And so... Um, yeah. I think that's another connection to be aware of. So, yeah, and then about looking at that process that we went through last year, reviewing and refining the curriculum, making sure that, um, I can't remember the term they use, but the conceptual layers or sequential development as a special term, I can't remember what they call it, but, um, you know, yeah, it's about looking at ways this might take a little while to just get your head around on how you work it, but you can actually then leverage it once you start implementing version nine to teach a much more broad approach to to the um to make the best use of your time. We understand people time for and it's yeah. it's a big curriculum to get through. Yeah, and as primary teachers, we do this, you know, in, already we look for those connections across curriculums. So this is just making it a little bit easier. Yeah. All right, so let's have a look at taking um, an activity from that known to to the unknown. So um, having a look at um, the image on the screen, use the chat to tell us what it is. What is what is this image and what is what is this image? Weather map? Yeah. How do you know? How do you know that? What are you using? What data are you using? Um, to identify that it's a weather map, map of Australia, temperatures across Australia, weather in different cities, a snapshot. Yep, so you're using weather symbols, symbols, temperatures. It's hot in Darwin, yes. <laughs> Jesse had his <laughs> air conditioner on before in Townsville and I'm sitting here in Canberra in a jumper and with a heated blanket. So, you know, different, different uh, across, across where we are. Place um, names. Yep. Okay, but what about this one? What about this image? What is this one? What? How's it different to the to the other um, map? So we've established that it was a map. Oh. Sorry, Tony. Um, Going too far. To blow my screen <laughs> giving, up so I can giving read it. it all, <laughs> giving it all away. <laughs> How are we going? Different cultures, different cultural lens, Indigenous seasons calendar, using proper names. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 And we can also see, and I suppose, Tony, I'll jump in. Sorry if you're mm. this is a good time. 
the um what we see there is that bridging again across from the known to the unknown so what you might see in that map is down the bottom you've got the four seasons and i'm not sure which place it is sorry um yeah okay. celia do you remember but um but then you've got the connection to summer autumn winter and this sort of just, it was a ghana country man. Ghana, thank you. Um, you know, and, and that's not always the case. So just be aware if you go and find an Indigenous weather map or something in your situation, there might be three seasons, there might be six seasons. Um, and it actually gives you a real good opportunity then to disguise, well, what are the cultural bias around how we talk about seasons? Um, you know, and well, when does a season start and end? And currently we justify seasons based on I don't know, the day changes and all of a sudden the season changes, uh, you know. So from a First Nations worldview and point of views around the different places, there's a bunch of different environmental indicators that can indicate the seasons change and indicate the transition in the seasons as well. Um, and, you know, and then you could really do deep, deep diving from your data representation to types of data. You could be really deep diving into a whole bunch of things around uh, the environment, around weather, around seasons, around all sorts of things I'll, I'll sort of leave it up into your very clever minds to think of the connections but the um it, I, I suppose it's just something to be wary of that even how this is presented is still presented with the from the um cultural bias and reality of, of the dominant discourse around it yeah and and we quite often uh, you know i know as a teacher i would quite often if i was teaching whether you would you know, quite often you start with this map because that's that's what I'm familiar with, and so that's what you go to. And but you know, it's, so we're wanting wanting to get you to stop and and think and identify those bias. What about this one then? What's so what are some some indicators in that image that we can use to predict what season it's in? I know when I um, step outside here in Canberra, you you step out and and feel what the what the weather is before you. You know, and then sometimes you can pick the season, but sometimes you can't. Yeah, it's funny because I was looking at that and thinking it was a really humid in the morning and you get the cloud fog setting in up, you get in the tablelands up in Northern Australia. So yeah. uh, where it's a bit, it's in the tro wet tropics, you know. So yeah, it's up, thanks. someone shared the Syro weather maps. They're a great resource to just get, and they're really, really nicely um, organised with lots of information. We're done in a really culturally responsive way to working with those communities. I know every community who doesn't want one has been knocking on Syro's door trying to get one um, because they, they, they're a fantastic teaching tool and they've got lots of information on them. This is, a, is another uh, activity that we're looking at with with data and this idea uses Bronwyn Bancroft's um, books. She has a, her images are just amazing in, in her books and starting from that place where students can discuss um, shapes and symbols to represent country and place and then the nature around them choosing something that they can create their symbols it's similar to what you did today you, you made your own symbols to represent your understanding um, of of a concept of a more abstract concept they could once they've drawn their symbols they could then create a narrative to explain their the shape and the connection to country uh, you could take that a little bit further then and they could um, take that take that narrative and develop an algorithm using pseudocode or flowcharts and then implement that using or digitize it using block based coding in primary school. So bringing that those narratives, digi digitizing those narratives that started off with with symbols and, and bringing that through. Yeah, so there was a um, moon hack 2022. I think if you can Google and probably share the link. Um... The, the kids went and worked with uh, the Tagai constellation, which is a story in the Torres Strait um, Islands about a, um, a hunter and, and, and goes on. I won't um, retell the story here, but essentially the students went and learnt the story from a, um, a knowledge holder who was able to share proper cultural protocol and share the ways. And then the students went and recreated the story within scratch, um, recorded their voices, told the story and moved the little... Um, uh, sprite around to tell different elements and it's a really really cool um i love tagai as a it's um the right hand well one of the hands i might um, catch myself out here but is the southern cross so it actually gives you an entire different perspective of the night sky in australia 
when you realise that the Southern Cross isn't just a one constellation, it is just the hand of this constellation that sprawls out across the sky, you know. And, and they're things that, um, you know, is a really cool way that you can look at local stories and local narratives, um, cultural narratives with the right permissions and people, and then retell those stories with permission, um, you know, utilising programs like Scratch to start stretching those um, those opportunities as well. So with the symbols, there's an opportunity to around if we want to start introducing binary as a language is we can start getting the students in their reality to abstract those two symbols down to two and start thinking about different combinations of how to tell those stories or tell different conversations using the two symbols and then bridging that across into the into the concepts we use around binary and strings and stuff like that. You know, So um, I just wanted to... The threads are there and there are lots of threads that can be pulled on to keep um, keep expanding and, and enriching what what was, um, uh, it, which is a pedagogical framework of the Gumpi model around how we can explore a heap of stuff. Um, so the next one we just wanted to throw out, so you could then connect it into your general capabilities around, um, you know, and the thing is the general capabilities around the ethical understanding and things, it's not really clear and some of these things and we want to just sing out some of the some of the big terms and things think about that for yourselves, really. Indigenous data sovereignty is, a, is interesting to look into about how we collect data and how we share and create Aboriginal ownership in data as well, uh, which is a big conversation, especially when um, it's probably a big conversation about Australian data sovereignty after the recent um, <laughs> recent hacks, you know what I mean, and who has our data and what and where and things like that. But it's a, it's a, it's also another layer because we're starting to look at the colonial aspects of Australia's history and where we've, where we've arrived to now in digitization of Indigenous artefacts, uh, access to knowledges and who can access the knowledge and how you can access it. Another big one's Indigenous cultural intellectual property. Um, you know, being sure certain that we're, if we're working with community and with people in, in our community, we're not going there and trying to extract information out to then hold it in the school and just deliver it. There's got to be a reciprocity there. So one of the examples, the story I use um, with the Tozzi artwork, the reciprocity is that will be up on the on the Stronger Smarter website with the story to download. Um, you know the, but for your context in your school or workplace or whatever, you, perhaps that's commissioning a story, a shared art piece from a local artist about the school or about whatever. Um, you know, and then that becomes a teaching tool you can use and the reciprocity there has been, you know, there's been an exchange of ideas. And I guess some, you know, just, just being aware of those terms are, are things to think about and be, be cognizant of. Um, in and in, up into time. those into those secondary years too, that ethical um, use, that ethical conversations, I think are really important. That comes through in the digital technologies curriculum as well as the digital literacy create um, capability that, um, you know, mm. if they're, if we are digitizing um, uh, intercultural, what is the intercultural exchange of, of knowledge and what are the risks involved? What are the protocols? Um, who owns those digitized assets? You know, you can, find images but who who actually owns them and as you just said what is what is the impact that that has on on our communities and on our first nations australians so you know yeah. that um, yeah. conversation and again you don't need to teach the entire concept you don't need to have to know the entire concept just introducing these things regularly throughout different touch points across child schooling career is still going to be better than not introducing them at all you know what I mean? Um, and whether the, these terms may not be the correct ones, you know, most kids know, do you take something or do you have an exchange for something? You know what I mean? Without yeah. even diving into it. So identifying bias, and I think we, we touched on this earlier, about acknowledging it and trying to remove it and having open conversations. It's really interesting in technology. I don't know if we've had a chance to look into it. We'll just jump straight onto the next slide, Tone. Yep. Um, you know, so what are our computer systems? And it's not just an issue for First Nations people. There is a the issue within a um, fairly uh, close cohort that are uh, moving into computer science, moving into these spaces, you know, and what we're seeing then is a lack of diversity within these spaces, which then actually creates uh, less rigidity in the processes or less security in certain things as well. It also has the opportunity for technology to have racist qualities because things may not have been considered in the algorithm that was designed because the world experience hasn't been kept the same very similar for 
other groups like our women in, in computer science and other um, ethnic minorities or culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Um, you know, and one of the things I think is really cool, like that's a, that we can think about all the bad things that happen, but let's think about all the cool things that could happen. Like imagine if we had um, our, if a certain telecos security system was actually coded in the Ghana language, it would be near unbreakable you know what i mean and why can't we explore and chase those opportunities and utilizing indigenous knowledges and processes correctly to then we could be creating a whole whole, whole heap of secure systems with that you know that's just one example off the top of my head but um like you know so we it's easy to find the negatives in the world and i think finding the flipping it what a strengths-based approach by creating a more open and and, and accessible um pathway for all students that will actually you know we know it's going to improve all those economic drivers and things like that that seem to be really important at the end of the day we want to give students an agency to have the choice if they want to pursue that pathway but what are some of the things that we want that are key that we want teachers to to consider when they're developing or reflecting on their units of work what what, what are some of the key things that that you think we should be taking away, Jesse? Yeah, look, I think it's coming down to make time to create relationships, which is, you know, uh, fairly obvious, and I'm sure I'm not telling you anything there. Make time for conversation in the classroom, but also make time to pair that relational build up with high quality pedagogical approaches. Bishop and Berryman put out a bunch of work um, around in Kaupapa Maori in New Zealand, uh, I don't know, it must have been five or six years ago, might even been longer, um, looking at that the biggest effect size on students' outcomes when you have teachers with a high relational um, ability and a high pedagogical ability. You wanted to be up in that upper right-hand quadrant, the upper upper right quadrant, by applying, not just being relationally focused, but also backing it up with a pedagogy that's shown to, um, or pedagogies that are shown to be more effective for a more or oh, broader range of people. You know what I mean? Um, not just, uh, you know, a pedagogy that's, um, that's going to be least less effective for less people, I guess. Um, so you know, it's it's got to come down to conversation, the relationships, but also backed up by good quality teaching and learning. Um, and you know, and, and make it real for the pathways and connecting to the the jobs that exist. Not even jobs that you might be. Oh, be a computer scientist. You know, how many jobs require digital literacy skill set today? 